tail in your decision rule. If there were two tails, you'd look for the two tail in the alpha value. But there's not two tails in this problem. There's only one tail, meaning that the column you use is the 1% one, one tail. Do you guys see the 1% one, one tail on your table? So that's the column. What value do you see there as a critical value? 2.718. So 0, the critical value is going to be negative 2.718. Now, if you have a small sample, you're going to use the what? The t table. OK? That's why you have two tables. And the t table is actually easier to use than the z table. It gives you the critical values automatically. You just have to know whether you're talking about one tail or two tail and the value of alpha for your column. The degree of freedom is is what it is. It's, it's 1 minus the sample size. So what's left now is to compute the test statistic x bar minus mu over s divided by the square root of n, where x bar is going to be 1.9. Again, mu is 2.2. It's what you see in the hypothesis. Here's the value of mu. Mu is greater than or equal to 2.2. You're going to use that value. Standard deviation is 0.7. The sample size is 12. So that now, if we compute this test statistic, we're looking at the difference of 1.9 minus 2.2 over 0.7 divided by the square root of 12. The numerators in parentheses, the denominators in parentheses. Okay. You enter this in your calculator, and what do you get as a test statistic value? It's going to be negative. Negative what? 1.48. The test statistic is a negative 1.48. So here's the deal. We have to see where that value lives in this decision rule. Now, 0 is here, negative values are to the left. The critical value is a negative 2.718. The question is, where does that test statistic live in relation to that critical value? Is it to the right or is it to the left? It's going to be to the right. As long as I know that the test statistic is to the right, I can label it anywhere. The point is, it's in the do not reject the null region, meaning the conclusion is to do not reject. The null, you're not rejecting the null. What does it mean not to reject the null? You're accepting the statement that the mean is at least 2.2 cups of coffee per week. So not rejecting that null means the sample is supporting this hypothesis, Okay, that the mean is at least 2.2. So here's the difference between everything that we've done so far and what we do now. We have a small sample. So for a small sample, you're going to use this t table. Okay? Anybody have any questions on this one? Yeah. Um, for the small sample, would that also apply to any other problem if it was a small sample as well? So you use the t table? Um, the answer is no. It's going to apply for small samples that have to do with the mean. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to give you that. So it's safe to say that the problems that they're going to give you, if it's small, you're going to use what? T table. OK. Anybody have any other questions? OK, here's the deal. So like I said, the critical thing here, what you have new is this process is the test statistic value. What was old, to some degree, was finding those critical values. OK, so without doing that, um, that's, that's going to throw out the whole process. So on a test situation, let's put a, a few notes here. On a test situation, you know, like I said, I'm thinking of going asking questions for each part so that each part is worth the same amount of points. I'm also going to put another note here. Here's a note.
This is also going to happen. It's also problems in your homework. Since this final is comprehensive, that means it's over the, the whole course. Okay. What you can see are problems in which you have a small sample. They can actually ask you to compute the sample mean. They may not give it to you like they did here. They gave it to you here, and you were happy. You're happy because they gave you the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. But in real life, they don't always, you don't even have this in real life. In real life, you have to compute it. Okay, so you'd probably use a computer because it'd be a large sample size. But part of the test is to see whether or not you can compute a mean. So what's the definition of a mean? Sum of the data divided by what? Sample size. So they may even ask you in some of those homework questions to compute the mean. They can also ask you to compute the standard deviation. You guys recall that that's the square root of the variance. The variance formula is n sum x squared minus sum x quantity squared over n times n minus 1. OK? So they can give you not this nice sample information. What they can do is something like this. They can give you now, um, instead of a sample of 12 students, yada, yada, they could now say something like this. Your sample data is 0, 4, 6, 3, 4, 2. They're going to they're gonna expect you to compute the sample mean, the sample uh, standard deviation, and to determine the sample size. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, what? 6. N is 6. So some of your homework questions on hypothesis testing for small samples are requiring, requiring you to compute the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. So what it's doing is that you have, to, you have to dust off these formulas and you have to use them. And traditionally, I've given that on the, on the final as well. I've asked people to do this. I compute a mean, variance, and standard deviation on the final. So go back to those notes on the mean, variance, and standard deviation. Brush up on that because I, I'll guarantee you it'll be there on the final. And it may even be there. And I can even tell you this. I've always given it on the final in the setting of a small sample and asked you to do estimation and hypothesis testing questions. So it's putting everything together. OK? So you want to review this. And it's going to be on your, your uh, test five as well. I'll have some of that too. OK, so that's where you're headed. But I just want to let you know, they don't always give you the sample mean and the sample standard deviation. They're going to ask you for some of the questions to do it yourself. OK, anybody have any questions on that? You sure? OK, um, let's see. This is the, um, the essence of hypothesis testing. These are what you do in some sense, in a very simple way. We're looking at those procedures. We're also going to look at two things, two other um, settings of hypothesis testing. Very often, people like to compare to the book calls independent groups. And it's sort of bad language. It should be not two independent groups. It should be two mutually exclusive groups. Okay, Mutually exclusive means that you don't have the same person on both lists. Okay, So we're going to compare, really, parameters from two 
mutually exclu exclusive groups. So we can compare parameters from, for example, parameters from two groups like men versus women. Okay, we're going to compare parameters about men versus women. Something simple like, for example, the average age of a lifespan of a male, or the lifespan of a male versus the lifespan of a, of a female. Meaning, what's the average age of a male when he dies versus the average age of a woman when he dies? Those comparisons can, can be used to indicate who lives longer. Okay, um, another example is you can compare men versus boys. Now, men being, I guess, guys older than what? Or at least 18, you could think of it. You could define it any way you like, but it should make some sense. Older than, um, well, I'm going to say at least 18. And boys, you can say, are younger than what? younger than 18. So these are two mutually exclusive groups. You're not going to find a single guy who's going to be on both lists. Similarly, women versus who? Girls. And it's the same sort of thing, that women are at least 18, or they are younger than 18. Okay, you can also define Smokers versus non-smokers. And obviously, you're going to have to now define what it means to be a smoker. It may mean you have to have a certain criteria. Maybe you smoke at least three cigarettes a week or something. Because some people can be defined as smokers as you know, smoking less than that. Or maybe you just say never smoke anything. Okay, but the point is you want two mutually exclusive groups and that will, you'll need a definition at times um, to indicate how you're dividing those type of people or that phenomena. Okay, so what we're doing here is you're going to now compare parameters from two independent groups, meaning you have two populations. Population one, and remember the parameters associated with any population, you have p, you have mu, sigma squared, and sigma for a population. Compare that with population 2. Where you got p, mu, sigma squared, and sigma. And for each population, you're going to be taking a sample like you did for the past type of problems. So you have two independent samples. If your populations are independent, your samples are independent. Sample one, sample two. So you're going to note that these samples are also independent. Okay, so there's independent samples. So here we go. We're going to look at first, we're going to compare first, comparing means, and compare population means. It has its test statistic. We're going to compare population proportions. OK, so here's your test statistic for population means. Sample mean 1 minus sample mean 2 divided by square root of the sample variance for the first group divided by the sample size of the first group 